You are listening to Gone But Never Forgotten. Our topics can include, but are not limited to, murder, sexual assault, graphic and gruesome details, and more. These topics are adult in nature and are not meant for everyone. Listener discretion is advised. Every time that we get to this point in a series on a killer, it is my favorite part. It's hard to read and research about the crimes that people committed and the lives that people ruined. With Paul Bernardo, the list is extensive. He raped so many young women. He at least took part in the murders of three women. And think of the mental torment that he has caused for families of his victims and even the torment that he has caused for officers and investigators that he eluded for such a long time because of his charm and his narcissism. Thankfully, though, his reign of terror would, and did, come to an end. In episode one, we talked about his young life and his crimes as the Scarborough Rapist. In episode two, we covered the three murders as he became the schoolgirl killer. This week, we cover the fall of the monster. Hello, everyone. My name is Lance, and welcome to episode 67 of Gone But Never Forgotten, The Fall of the Narcissist, Part 3, on Paul Bernardo. Last week we ended the episode by telling you about the fight that Paul and Carla got into and the beating that Carla took at the hands of Paul. Her co-workers alerted her family and in a hospital Carla would admit to the abuse and she would press charges against Paul. At the same time, coincidentally, Paul's DNA from two years earlier was finally checked in the Scarborough rapist case. Things were about to fall apart fast and hard for Paul. 26 months now after Paul had submitted his DNA sample to the Toronto police, they were told that the DNA match from Paul was a match to the Scarborough rapist. Immediately, Paul was placed under 24-hour surveillance. On February 9th of 1993, investigators from the Metro Toronto Assault Squad would have an interview with Carla. Carla didn't give up any answers in regards to their suspicions of Paul. Instead, she focused only on the abuse that she had personally faced at his hands. After filing charges, Carla would move to Brampton, Ontario, where she would move in with her aunt and uncle. When she was safely there, she told them that Paul was the Scarborough rapist and, on top of that, Paul was also the schoolgirl killer. She told them in no uncertain terms that Paul and her had been behind the rapes and murders of Kristen French and Leslie Mahaffey. She told them that not only was it them, but that the rapes and tortures had been recorded on video. Subsequently, the death of Tammy Homolka was also reopened and investigated because of the tie into the other crimes. Two days after she met with the Toronto police, Carla would lawyer up. She went to a lawyer from Niagara Falls named George Walker. George immediately reached out to investigators and told them that Carla would be willing to cooperate with all of the investigation in exchange for legal immunity. She would also be placed under 24-hour surveillance by the investigators. Suddenly, two cases that had been seemingly without a solid lead were thrown into overdrive, and everything started to come together quickly. The appeal for full immunity for Carla was denied by Prosecutor Murray Segal on February 14, 1993. 
1993, only five days later. The reason was that while the two talked about everything that Carla knew, the videotapes were brought up, of course. Seagal would tell Walker that it was impossible to give Carla full immunity because she had been involved directly in the crimes. Four days later, Paul Bernardo was arrested on several charges and the investigators also obtained a search warrant. The problem with the charges and the search warrant was that there was very little evidence that actually tied Paul to the murders, and that meant that the search warrant itself was very restricted. Only evidence that was expected and named within the search warrant was allowed to be removed from Paul and Carla's home. If any video evidence was found inside of the home, it had to be watched inside of the home, and it was not allowed to be removed. The search of the home was, in a word, thorough. The search would last for 71 days, and only one tape was recovered. That tape depicted Carla Homolka performing oral sex on Jane Doe. The rest of the tapes that Carla had mentioned and that had been the reason for her not receiving a plea deal were not located in those 71 days. That search carried on until April 29th of 1993. Those tapes would become, of course, an integral part of the case. What happened with them was shocking. Paul Bernardo had told his lawyer during a call from jail that the rape videos were hidden in a ceiling light fixture that was located in the upstairs bathroom of the home. Murray Segal would find the tapes and hide them from investigators. Later, Murray would resign as legal counsel for Paul and his new attorney, John Rosen, would turn the tapes directly over to the police. On May 5th, Carla's lawyer would be informed that the government was going to offer Carla a plea deal. They wanted her to agree to a prison sentence of 12 years, and she had one week to think the offer over and accept. If she did not accept the offer, they were going to charge her with two counts of first-degree murder, one count of second-degree murder, and various other charges. Walker immediately told the investigators that they would take the deal, and Carla would also agree later to that deal. The plea bargain was finalized on May 14th. Carla immediately opened up to police and told them that Paul had bragged many times about the rapes and the sheer number of women that he had raped. She told investigators that he had, been, he had often told her that he had raped more than 30 women. That number was twice as many as the police were suspecting and aware of. The courts would put a publication ban in place in regards to Carla Homolka's inquiry. This was done because everyone involved wanted and needed Paul to have a fair trial so that there would not be anything that could cause a mistrial. If you are into true crime, you definitely do understand this. When you know that you have someone essentially dead to rights for the crimes that Paul had committed, you need to be extra careful to make sure that every T is crossed and every I is dotted. You cannot make one error along the way. Far too many criminals either get away with things or tie up the legal system for eons because of minor mistakes. That ban was put into place on July 5th by the Ontario Court of Justice. Of course, fighting every step of the way as the prosecution has to do, they said that imposing such a ban was already essentially telling the public that Paul Bernardo was guilty. Carla was not only giving up a lot of testimony, but in many ways Paul's team felt that Carla was being painted as a victim and not as a guilty and implicit party in these crimes. Publication bans don't tend to work as well in Canada for various reasons. Nowadays, it's largely because of the internet, but back here in the early days, the biggest problem was that American media outlets could report on the trial and things that were being said because the publication ban could not be upheld in another country. 
Details were divulged to the world and, of course, to Canada by various media outlets from the United States and the United Kingdom. Things were taken very seriously, though, and at the border, anyone that had more than one copy of an American newspaper had the rest of the newspapers taken away at the border crossing. That's really crazy. Like, that's, a, that's a step for a court case. American newspapers even started to be forbidden from being distributed in Ontario. That included the New York Times. One former police officer, Gordon Dom, would even be convicted of two counts of contempt of court for sending details to members of foreign media outlets. Carla Homolka would officially be divorced from Paul Bernardo in February of 1994. In 1995, Paul would go to trial for the murder of Leslie Mahaffey and the murder of Kristen French. That trial would include testimony from Carla Homolka, and the videos of the rapes would be shown in court. Paul would in turn testify that the deaths of both girls were accidental, and later on, he would even try to, as mentioned in episode 2, pin the murders on Carla alone. On September 1st, 1995, Paul Bernardo was convicted of many offenses, including two convictions for first-degree murder and two convictions for aggravated sexual assault. He would be sentenced to life in prison without the possibility for parole for at least 25 years. He was also designated as a dangerous offender, which in Canada means that there is a very small chance that he will ever be released from prison. For those of you keeping score at home, that's a damn good thing because not even including time owed, it's already been over 25 years now since Paul was convicted. Finally, after the abuse, the rape, the torture, and the murder of many innocent victims, the Scarborough rapist and the school school girl killer was right where he belonged, in prison, hopefully, for the rest of his life. As we covered in the episode covering the Kingston Penn riots, people like Paul Bernardo do not have an easy time in prison either. As much as people on the outside of the prison system obviously look down on Paul and people like Paul who do things like he did, people on the inside in the prison system are much the same. There is a hierarchy in prison, and child abusers and rapists like Paul are at the very bottom of that hierarchy. For that reason, Paul was, and I believe still is, kept in segregation from the rest of the prison population. Prisoners find ways, though. Ways to show someone where they stand. Paul was attacked and harassed in prison at every opportunity. He was even punched in the face by another inmate as he returned to his cell from a shower in 1996. In June of 1999, five convicts tried to make their way into the segregation area of the prison to get to Paul, but they were stopped with riot gas. Now, some of you out there might be wondering if it would be so bad if they had just allowed the other inmates to get to him. I won't disagree. In February of 2006, the Toronto Star would report that Paul had admitted that he had assaulted at least 10 more women in cases that happened mostly in 1986, before what was considered to be the crimes of the Scarborough Rapist. Paul was also suspected in many other crimes. Those crimes included rapes in Amherst, New York, and the drowning death of Terry Anderson in St. Catharines. Paul has not ever stated that he was a part of those later crimes. Also in 2006, Paul would give an interview from prison, and he said that he had changed his life and he was a changed man. He said that as such, he believed that he would make a good candidate for parole. This only 10 years after he was convicted of his crimes. We briefly covered the Faint Hope Clause in Canada in a previous episode, but I will quickly give you a synopsis here. 
The faint hope clause was a clause that would offer an inmate that was serving a life sentence for murder or for high treason the chance to move their parole admissibility date up from 25 years to 15 years. This clause was removed from the criminal code in 1997, but since Paul's conviction came before it, he was able to use it. In 2008, Paul was able to apply for that early parole eligibility, but he actually did not try to use it. In 2013, Paul Bernardo was moved from Kingston Penitentiary to Mill Haven in Bath, Ontario, and still placed in segregation. In 2015, Paul Bernardo would apply for day parole in Toronto, which would give him the ability to venture out into the public during the day as long as he returned to custody at night. It's still believed and hoped that because of his dangerous offender status, Paul Bernardo will not ever be granted parole on any level. On October 17th of 2018, he was denied day and full parole. On June 22nd of 2021, he would again attempt to get parole, and after only a one-hour hearing, parole was again denied. That brings us to Carla Homolka. The plea deal that was given to Carla has been very criticized over the years because of where she is now. Investigators have said that the problem here was that the tapes that depicted the crimes were not found for such a long time, and because of that, they needed the testimony of Carla Homolka. When the tapes came to light, there were certainly regrets, and investigators have said that she would never have received the plea deal if the tapes were seen before the plea deal was offered. In those tapes, Carla was visually a very willing accomplice in all of the crimes that Paul did. To this day, Paul does stand firm in the fact that Carla also was the person that had done the killing. So, that is certainly all up for interpretation. As an aside on the tapes as well, in 2006, police determined that there was no need to keep the videotapes and that there would be no future use for the tapes, so they were all destroyed. After the case, Carla would be sent to Kingston's Prison for Women, and she would even take correspondence courses while there from Queen's University, where she received her bachelor's degree in psychology. In 1997, Carla was moved to Joliet Institution, which is a medium security prison in Joliet, Quebec, which is just to the northeast of Montreal. In 2001, she was transferred again, this time to the St. Anne des Plaines Institution. That is a maximum security prison in Quebec. In 2008, Carla would write a letter of apology to her family, and she said that Paul made her get sleeping pills from work. He threatened her, and he physically and mentally abused her any time that she didn't do precisely what he wanted. Carla was set for release on July 4, 2005, and before she was released, there was a hearing about the eligibility and she had restrictions placed upon her as a condition of her release from prison. She was to always make police aware of where she lived and who she lived with at all times. She was to report any changes to her name. She needed to give 72 hours notice before leaving home for more than 48 hours. She was not allowed to ever be in contact with Paul, or the families of Leslie, Kristen, or Jane Doe, nor any other violent criminals. She was not allowed to be with anyone under the age of 16. She was not allowed to take any drugs. She needed to take therapy and counseling, and she needed to provide a DNA sample. Carla would be released on July 4th, 2005, and it's believed that she is still living in Quebec with a new family, new name, and new life. There was a stir up in the news when it was found that she may be working closely with a school, but for the most part her life has stayed quiet from the public eye. Many people to this day are terribly upset that she is still living on the outside. 
One very cool thing did come out of this case, albeit a lot of innocent people suffered for it to happen. Ontario is now the only place in the world that has a computerized case management network for murder and sexual assault, meaning that all municipal police forces and the Ontario Provincial Police have access to all cases, even when out of jurisdiction. That system is known as Power Case. So where do you sit on this case? There seems to be essentially two prevailing thoughts on this case and how it played out. The first is that Carla played the system, and she was definitely the beneficiary of necessity. When the police didn't have the tapes, they needed Carla, and they needed her testimony, and all of that was on paper before the tapes were handed over. Essentially, Carla is out of prison because Paul's first lawyer hid the tapes and made her a must-have for the prosecution against Paul. When the tapes were seen and showed, that made a difference according to the people who saw them. The second is that Carla was indeed a victim. She ended up in a relationship with a sexual sadist and with a man that knew how to use, abuse, and sweet talk his way through anything, and he was able to mold her into exactly the person and accomplice that he wanted. People who believe this even believe that it's possible that Carla may have done the actual killing at the bidding of Paul because she was very much under his spell. It is an interesting case and the fallout is just as interesting. Paul, likely and hopefully, will never see the outside world and honestly thank God for that. It doesn't even matter at the end of the day what part Carla did or did not play. Paul was certainly groomed into a horrible monster of a man, whether that was his own DNA makeup or because of what he saw and heard his father doing. In my opinion, he is someone that certainly could and would reoffend on some level if he was ever released. Carla certainly is an interesting story, if you ask me. Without knowing her and them, obviously, it's likely what... It's likely that we will never know how implicit she was and how much she was a victim. But either way, her cards were played right and she managed to perhaps beat the system and create an entirely new life. We are stuck only hoping and praying that she will not reoffend and that she has either changed or never was the monster that many believe she is. I want to leave you with one last tidbit. At one point, at one of the parole hearings that Paul Bernardo had, when he was declined parole, Paul would tell the parole board that it was very hard to be him inside of a prison. It's funny how that works, isn't it? What do you think? Weigh in with me on socials, drop me an email, or hit me up on Patreon and support the show, and let's chat! I always like to hear from people that know the cases like this one and can give some insight into how they feel and why they feel that way. And of course, like I said, join me on Patreon for exclusive video of my deeper thoughts on the case. And then, hopefully we will see all of you goners back here for the next episode of Gone But Never Forgotten. Be safe and be better.